Um, and now today, I think, inspired by my great assistance, uh, I'm going to give you sort of a set piece lecture on intentionality. Uh, Jennifer says that not everybody's understanding intentionality. So at the end of today, heed or no, you will, right? Uh, all right, it's very simple. Step one, the definition. Intentionality is simply that feature of mental states by which they are directed at or about something. So examples of intentional states are things like belief and desire and hope and fear, uh, not to mention perception and intending in the ordinary sense. Examples of things that are not intentional states are things like pains or anxiety where you're not anxious about anything or just feeling nervous. Now there's a minimal sense in which pain is intentional because it's about the part of your body that hurts. And a good test for intentionality is it can it fail or succeed? Can you get it right or wrong? And you sort of can with pains. You can have a phantom limb. You think you got a pain in your toe and you haven't got a toe, right? So pain is a good case for a marginal case. But beliefs and desires and hopes and fears are not marginal. They're standard cases of intentionality. OK, that's the definition. Everybody's got that, right? OK, now our task as philosophers is to explain, well, what the hell is that? How does it work? Uh, what is meant by uh, this aboutness that intentional states allegedly have? And I'm going to erase all this other stuff. Is that all right? Um, and uh, the best way to see how it works is to see that your typical intentional states have a certain kind of content. If you believe it's a hot day, then you have a belief that P, it's a hot day. If you want it to be a hot day, then you have a desire that P, same intentional content, different intentional state. Everybody's got that. So for any intentional state, you have to make a difference between the state content and the state type. There are two parts to any intentional state. And those are the type of state that it is and the content that it has. OK, now the ones that are most interesting to us, like belief and desire and hope and fear, have whole propositions as contents. But you get some intentional states that don't have a whole proposition, uh, like love and hate. Uh, you can just love Sally or hate Billy. And here, you don't have a whole propositional content. You just have a noun. Now, you can love the fact that Sally's a Republican. That's OK, too. But it needn't. In the case of belief and desire, it has to be a whole proposition. But it doesn't with love and hate. Well, what's going on in those cases? Well, I'm going to argue later on that really uh, love and hate are full of beliefs and desires. And they do have uh, a whole proposition. So it isn't obvious that love and hate and, and uh, pride and shame have whole propositions. But in a way, they do, though I haven't got that far yet. OK, everybody's up to this part. For the cases that are interesting to us are going to have a type of state and a propositional content. Now, that propositional content is going to relate the state to reality in this respect. Beliefs can be true or false. Desires can be fulfilled or frustrated. Intentions can be carried out or not carried out. In each case, there will come to be a match or fail to be a match between the intentional state and the reality, right? And I need a name for all of those conditions in the world which make the state either fit or fail to fit the reality. And I call those conditions of satisfaction. Now, satisfaction would be misleading if you think it means conditions under which it's fun. No, it's not satisfying in that sense. It isn't fun uh, to have the belief uh, that you've got a terminal illness. But your belief will be satisfied if and only if you do have a terminal illness. I need a name to satisfy what corresponds to the beliefs being true the desires being fulfilled, and the intentions being carried out. And I say in every case, the intentional state is satisfied. OK, so now we've got a rather strong theory that intentional states that have a whole propositional content look like they are representations of their conditions of satisfaction. Now we have to add something, and that is there are different ways in which the conditions of satisfaction are represented. Beliefs are supposed to be true or false, so they 
hover over reality and point downhill at the reality. Desires and intentions are not supposed to be true or false, but fulfilled or carried out. And I say for that reason that they have this uphill or world to mind direction of fit, whereas beliefs have the mind to world direction of fit. The simplest rough and ready test for the downhill direction of fit is can it be true or false? I and uh, beliefs can be true or false literally in a way that desires and intentions can't be true or false. Now it's a bit tricky because of course perceptions, when I uh, see this object in front of my face, uh, that can be satisfied or not satisfied. And in ordinary English we don't say my visual experience was true or my perception was true. Philosophers invent this ugly expression veridical, which just means true. And they say my visual experience was veridical, but that's the idea they're getting at, is that the, uh, this works, this downhill works for visual experiences, uh, just as this uphill works for intentions in the ordinary sense in which I intend to go to the movies. Okay. Now we can say, it's a bit tricky to say it, but as a first stab we can say, Intentional states that have a direction of fit are representations of their conditions of satisfaction. Now there are a whole lot of things we haven't explained. How do they do that? How is it represented? But at least we've got this much. We have the bare bones of a theory of intentionality. All right, now if you understand th that much, you understand an awful lot about intentionality. So let's stop and take questions. Everybody got that much. There are four notions I want you to get. I want you to get the notion of the content of the state and the type of state. I want you to get the notion of the direction of fit and the type will determine the direction of fit. And I want you to get the notion, the key notion of conditions of satisfaction. And the, and the whole point of this in biology, the whole point in our life is intentionality relates us to the environment. It relates us to other people and the surrounding environment by representing what we're going to do in the case of intention, what we want to happen in the case of desire, what we fear will happen in the case of fear, what we believe is happening in the case of belief, and so on through the other cases. It's a very powerful theory. Now we have a whole lot of other questions we need to answer. How does it carry over to language? Language also has intentionality. There's a special name for the intentionality of language. It's called meaning. And what is meaning? Well, we one step at a time. I want to make sure you understand intentionality before I explain meaning. A second thing we got to understand is how does this apparatus apply to intentions in the ordinary sense in which I intend to go to the movies? And I started on that last time and I want to finish that today. A third question we need to answer is well, how does it work really for the cases like love and hate and pride and shame where you don't obviously have a propositional content? I waved my hand and said, well, you got to have beliefs and desires, and they, they, those do have a propositional content. But still, that raises a hell of a difficult question for us. How does the whole theory work for the dreaded emotions? And here's a scandal. Uh, nobody has a, a decent theory of the emotions. But what the hell, we got till Christmas. Oh, let's get one uh, between now and Christmas. Uh, and the theories that are out there are really more or less kooky. I mean, uh, just I had to go and give a lecture on the emotions in Geneva last week. So I thought, well, hell, I'll read people that I haven't read before. And I read Sartre on the, on the airplane. And I have a recommendation. Do not read Jean-Paul Sartre while flying on an airplane. If, you, if you're not airsick already, you'll get airsick, okay. Esquisse sur un théorie des émotions. I mean, you gotta, some kind of uh, stuff you gotta say in French. Uh, uh, because otherwise the sheer, well, anyway, won't come across. Okay. All right, so that's a, another question. Now then, there's a special question for us. I hope somebody's keeping track of these because I got four neat questions here and I'll forget them unless somebody writes them down. The fourth question is this. What about collective intentionality? You see, we're, our aim is to get an account of society. But society has, requires more than one person as a locus of intentionality. 
and in particular, it requires collective intentionality. And then in particular, when we get to mot social motivation, it requires collective emotions. What a thought. And the horrendous experiences of the 20th century were the harnessing of collective emotions uh, for massive uh, uh, periods of slaughter that if future generations will find us, uh, find our site endurable all, at all, they will find these uh, ideas ridiculous. I mean, what is it that was so precious that they went out in the First World War and killed millions of people over what appear to be rather trivial points of dispute uh, within uh, a certain set of very local European uh, uh, background presuppositions where United States is part of Europe uh, for these purposes. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they did it. Uh, and here is an amazing fact. The main focus of collective intentionality over the, uh, of, over the past couple of centuries has been a weird institution called the nation state where the state, which is a political institution, comes together with the nation, which is a cultural institution. And that has been the main focus of loyalty. And it still is. Uh, there are a lot of people who will die for the United States. I don't know anybody who will die for Alameda County. Alameda, I live in Alameda County. I'm very fond of Alameda County. I wish it was a better run and had lower taxes. But I won't die for it. Okay, but when it comes to the United States, well, it's a different story. People feel strongly about the United States. What the hell is going on here? And the fact that the Europeans had this collective intentionality built around the nation state led to massive slaughter. And the chief motivating force it hasn't even got a name, but it's the complex of, of notions that cluster around the notions of pride and shame, honor, victory and defeat, disgrace, and dishonor, and humiliation, uh, as well as victory and exaltation. And the Europeans were willing to kill each other by the millions and to drag us in. We went in eagerly uh, to join in the slaughter. And now it's all over. You can't make sense. Uh, Germans and Frenchmen who've been killing each other for generations, they don't want to kill each other at all. Maybe occasional bar fight, but uh, n uh, nothing very serious. And they replaced warfare with another source of great pride and shame. It's called football. It's not really football, but they call it football. Uh, and here's the amazing thing. When France won the World Cup, I was uh, there when France won the World Cup. There was more celebration in the streets of Paris than at any time since the end of the Second World War. You want to know what victory means? It's la coupe du monde. OK. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're still figuring about the structure of intentionality. And I want, you to, I want, I want everybody clear on these four notions, the notion of the propositional content and the psychological mode the notion of the direction of fit, and the notion of the conditions of satisfaction as determined by the propositional content with a direction of fit. I'm going to stop and take questions about that. Everybody's up with us on that. Yeah. 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 I, 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 the word representation has a very sordid history. And most people uh, use it to mean something phenomenological. It means you've got to have a thought in your head or an image or a picture. I don't mean it that way. It's just functional. And if you don't like the word representation, just say has. Every intentional state has conditions of satisfaction. Now, I think it's useful to use the word notion of representation, provided your member is defined functionally and not phenomenologically. If you think it's divine phenomenologically, then you get in all kinds of mess. And then you're in bed with a whole lot of philosophers who are called phenomenologists. And that's real bad news. You don't want to do that. Don't get in bed with those guys on a hot day. Uh, I mean, it, it, all kinds of terrible things can happen. OK, so I'll talk, maybe I'll talk about them later. But my use of the notion of representation is utterly innocent. It just means it, it has a certain function. It relates in a certain way. And if you like, just don't use it. Just say, has condition satisfaction. Later on, 
we'll get to a type of representation, though, which is special, and I call it a presentation, and there you have a direct uh, conscious contact between the conditions of satisfaction represented in the mind and the conditions of satisfaction that are in the world. We'll get to that in, in, a, in a few minutes. Yeah. The, no, the propositional content always determines the condition of satisfaction. But uh, sometimes it determines it with a downhill direction of fit, that's beliefs, and sometimes it can, uh, determines it with an uphill direction of fit, that's uh, desires. Uh, now, what difference does it make? I mean, if A fits B, B fits A. Well, you're going to find it makes a tremendous difference when we get to the theory of action. Because in the case of action, the intention itself has to cause the behavior that constitutes the conditions of satisfaction. So you have uh, the mind to world direction of causation and the world to mind direction of fit. And that's a very deep point that's actually, I've actually written it down on that sheet of paper you have, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. Yes. Yeah. That's right. The propositional content, that's a good point. The propositional content itself is neutral about direction of fit. If I believe it's raining, I have exactly the same propositional content as if I wish it was raining. Uh, but uh, the direction of fit is different in the two cases, and that's going to be important for how we relate to reality, and especially important when causation gets into it, when, it, when, the, uh, the, there's a, when the intentional causation between the phenomena and the reality come into play. Okay, those are good questions. Any other questions at this point? All right, now then, here's how we got last, last how far we got last time. Um, it looks like uh, there ought to be a simple theory of the relation of intention and action. And the reason it looks like it is, you say every intentional state is a representation of its condition of satisfaction. Well, why not just say, the intention, if I intend to go to the movies, then the condition of satisfaction of my intention is that I go to the movies, and it's just like any other intentional state. So you could say an intention is just an intentional state that has an action as its condition of satisfaction. Okay, why doesn't that work? Well, I gave you three reasons it doesn't work. It leaves it mysterious why we have this special vocabulary of action, uh, which we don't have for beliefs and desires. And what are we talking about when we talk about intentional actions as opposed to unintentional actions and actions that are inadvertent, on purpose, deliberate, uh, 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 by mistake or by accident? What's going on in all of those cases? Hi, uh, and, and, and I, uh, that's one uh, uh, puzzle, is that I, w w the, there's a special vocabulary which you don't have for intentionality generally, and that uh, philosophers are going to get suspicious about that. And the second thing is there does seem to be a special connection between intention and action, which you don't get between other intentional states and their conditions of satisfaction. It looks like you can't even have an unintentional action unless there's some intention kicking around. So to take a famous case, Oedipus married his mother unintentionally. He married Jocasta intentionally. But now, was he a bigamist? He married two women? No, there was only one marriage because unknown to him, Jocasta was his mother. So he, un he performed one action, which consisted of marrying Jocasta intentionally, that's his girlfriend, and marrying his mother unintentionally, and that got him in a hell of a mess. You remember at Colonus, where he lost his eyesight and stuff like that. Um, but in any case, it looks like in those cases, you don't have an unintentional action unless there's an intentional action. And it's one and the same event, which is both intentional and unintentional. What's going on? And then at the very end, last time, I gave you some puzzle cases where you have an intention, and the intention is to do something, and the guy does the thing he intended to do, but he didn't carry out his intention. And in the cases we considered, the intention even caused the doing of the thing he intended to do, but all the same, he didn't carry out his intention. He didn't do it intentionally. You remember, I gave you three examples of that. Uh, the Chisholm case where Bill wants to kill his uncle, and he 
uh, is going driving around the Berkeley Hills thinking about uh, his intention to kill his uncle, and his intention to kill his uncle makes him so nervous that he runs over a, a pedestrian who happens to be his uncle. Everybody remembers that case. Okay, then there's a second case that's just like that, except it involves a, a, a much uh, uh, a smaller uh, physical action, and that's Davidson's case of the high climber who wishes to rid himself of weight and danger, as Davidson put it, uh, by loosening his hold on the rope. He's holding the other climber, but his intention to loosen his hold on the rope makes him so nervous that he inadvertently drops the rope. He didn't do it on purpose or intentionally, but he dropped it unintentionally. Now what's going on in that case? He had the intention to drop the rope. His intention caused him to drop the rope, but he didn't carry out his intention. He didn't drop the rope intentionally. Okay. Then the third case was due to a Davidson student. Uh, by the way, I've never been mountain climbing with uh, Davidson, but we used to go skiing together. Uh, but we never got on a rope with each other. Uh, but in, in any case, that's his, it's a famous example in his work. Uh, and the third case was his student, Bennett, who imagined that Jones wishes to kill Smith. And to that end, he goes out and fires his gun at Smith, misses Smith by a mile, but the shot stampedes a herd of wild pig, the, a herd of wild pigs that trample poor Smith to death. So his intention to kill Smith caused the death of Smith, but it certainly doesn't look like first degree murder. It's different from the other two cases in a way that Waze it all explained to you, but still we've got these cases, and this is, I mean, as Bertrand Russell says, in philosophy you have to stock your mind with paradoxes, have a bunch of paradoxes in your pocket and figure out how they work. So we need to explain these paradoxical cases. Okay, let's go to work and do it. Now, Here's how far we got so far. I've explained the bare bones of a theory of intentionality, and now I have to give you a theory of action and show how it fits in to the theory of intentionality. Okay, any questions about that part, about why we're having trouble assimilating action to this simple theory? Are you saying that action is a Yes. Um, I'm saying that actions have propositional can content. I haven't said it explicitly, but our uh, specific, uh, the, the, the specific requirement of any kind of intentionality is for any intentional state, you have to be able to specify what the content is. And I'm now going to specify the content that goes as part of intentional action. And that's what we're going to do. Okay, so here goes. The first step is that we need to distinguish between the intention that you have prior to performing the action and the intention that you have while you're actually performing the action. And I call that the distinction between the prior intention and the intention in action. And you can illustrate this with very simple examples. Now, when we start off on an investigation like this, I, you have to take these Mickey Mouse examples like raising your arm or scratching your head because you need something simple to work with. Later on, we'll get to things like writing the great American novel or starting the revolution or, or o overcoming the alienation of, of uh, humanity in post-industrial society. Those are tougher cases, but it's the same apparatus has got to work for all of them. So we're going to start with these Mickey Mouse actions. And I want to say there's a distinction between my prior intention when I intend to do something in the future and the intention that I have while I'm actually doing it, while I'm actually carrying out the intention. And we'll go through it with a simple case. I form a prior intention to raise my arm in 30 seconds. What's the propositional content? Is that I raise my arm in 30 seconds. But while I'm actually raising my arm, in the actual, in the actual period of raising my arm, the intentional content is not that I perform the action of raising my arm, but rather, that my arm goes up. So you have uh, this uh, difference between the content of the prior intention, which represents a whole action, and the intention in action, which represents a bodily movement. What's going on? Well, uh, there is a 
another feature. Let's say this is our first point. You need a distinction between prior intention and intention and action, and that is both prior intentions and intention and action have a causal component in the conditions of satisfaction. What's the proof of that? Suppose I form a prior intention to raise my arm in 30 seconds, and I forget all about the prior intention. Suppose in 30 seconds I raise my arm for some totally different reason. I'm, I'm a retired shortstop, and somebody hits a line drive, and just as a sort of reflex, I reach up and grab it out of the sky. Okay. Uh, now, was I carrying out my intention? No, I was not. Why? because the intention itself did not function in the carrying out of the intention. So our rule is, and this goes back to his question, we have to spell out the conditions of satisfaction. And the uh, conditions of satisfaction of the prior intention are that I raise my arm and this prior intention causes that I raise my arm. Okay, does everybody see that? That is the condition of satisfaction of the prior intention is not just that the action occurs, but the prior intention itself has to function causally in the production of the action. However, any philosopher is going to get nervous about this because what kind of causation is this? And also it looks like you got a reference to a whole action here. What's that? Because this means I perform the action of raising my arm, and what is an action? That's our next question. Okay, what are the components of an action? Again, we're taking the simple Mickey Mouse cases. Well, it seems to me, if you look at the simplest kind of cases, we have overwhelming evidence, both philosophically and empirically, that the two components of an intentional action, if the intention involves a bodily movement, is there must be some kind of a conscious experience of acting, and there must be a bodily movement. And the simplest proofs of this have been uh, with experiments that go back a long time. Um, so simple action consists of an experience of acting, we'll call that EA, plus a bodily movement. Uh, and let me give you the, uh, the arguments for that. Um, uh, there's a guy who was a, a neurosurgeon uh, in uh, Montreal. I never met him. His name was uh, uh, Penfield. And he, I, I met his uh, colleague Rasmussen and, and talked about some of these cases. Uh, but Penfield, uh, he was the best brain stabber for a thousand miles in any direction. And you had something wrong with your brain, you went to Montreal and paid the money and had him work on your brain. Now what he discovered was that if he opened up the skull of the patients and he could put a microelectrode on the motor cortex, he could not make the patient's limbs move. So it must be kind of creepy. You're lying there on the table. Pen uh, field is messing around inside your brain, and your arm suddenly goes up. Now Penfield says, when I have caused a patient's limb to move, I asked him about it. And you think, you better ask the guy about it. You're messing around in his brain. The patients are fully conscious during all this. And invariably, the patient says, I didn't do that. You did it. So this is the case where the guy had no experience of acting but he just had the bodily movement. And Penfield also says, when I have caused a patient to vocalize, uh, invariably they say, I didn't say that. I didn't make that sound. You pulled it out of me. Now, he doesn't tell us what they vocalize. I assume it's not the Canadian national anthem, but I assume it's probably like, oh, uh, oh, uh, is they just make noises. But he can cause the noises to come out just by uh, activating the motor cortex with a uh, microelectrode. That's a case where you have a bodily movement, but there's no experience of acting. The body just moves as if you were acting, but you're not acting. One of the components is missing. There are other cases where you have the experience of acting, but no bodily movement. And those are uh, the first case of that that I know of was William James describes the following. He says, we took a patient 
We took a subject and put him in a dark room and anesthetized his arm. And then we told him, raise your arm. Now the guy did something, he couldn't see, it's completely dark, and his arm's anesthetized, he can't feel it, but he did what felt to him like this, only the arm didn't go up, because they were holding the arm at his side. Now that was a case of the guy who had uh, the EA, had the experience of acting, uh, but he did not have the bodily movement. Okay, in the normal case, the action consists of the experience of acting plus the bodily movement. Furthermore, the experience of acting has to cause the bodily movement. If something else causes the bodily movement, then it's not a case of a successfully performed intentional action. All right, so now what have we got? We got uh, uh, three principles. You need a distinction between the prior intention and the intention in action, and the proof is they have different conditions of satisfaction, for reasons we'll see in a second. Um, the second uh, point is that they're both causal, and the third principle is the typical action consists of an experience of acting plus a bodily movement. Now let's put all that together. The first point to make is that that conscious experience, when I'm raising my arm, uh, just is the intention and action. You need two notions because the experience of acting is by definition conscious and not all intentions in action are conscious. You do a lot of things un uh, uh, intentionally but unconsciously. There is an ordinary English word that uh, corresponds pretty closely to the intention and action and that's the notion of trying. If you tried to carry out the order, you tried to raise your arm, but you failed, all the same, you did try, you had an intention in action. So we can now give a rather simple picture of the relation of intentions to action. Uh, the way it works is this. I have a prior intention to raise my arm. The conditions of satisfaction are that this prior intention causes the action of raising my arm, but now, and this is the next crucial part, the action of raising my arm consists of two components, the intention and action, where the intention and action has to cause the bodily movement. So you have a prior intention, and that causes an action, but the whole action consists of two components, an intention and action, where the intention and action has to cause the bodily movement. And you can say either that the prior intention causes the action, or you can say the prior intention causes the intention and action, which causes the bodily movement. Because you get a transitivity of causation, A causes B, and B causes C, you can say A causes uh, B plus C, or you can say A causes C by way of causing B. All right, now I want to slow down and make sure everybody gets this, because this is the simplest picture of the simplest type of intentional action. You have a prior intention, it causes an action. The action consists of two components, an intentional action, which is just an experience of acting if it's conscious, and which is a case of trying in the ordinary English sense. Uh, and the trying, the intention and action, causes the bodily movement. Notice in both of these cases, both the prior intention and the intention and action, we are giving the propositional content. The propositional content of the prior intention are, this prior intention has to cause the whole damn thing. And the propositional content of the intention and action are, this intention and action has to cause the bodily movement. The action just consists in the intention and action plus the bodily movement, where the intention and action causes the bodily movement. Okay, that is the simple picture. Now I want to go through and show us how it solves our puzzles. Yes? So are the intention and action the experience Yes, the experience of acting when conscious, well, sorry, the intention and action when conscious is a, an experience of acting. I'm using the notion of experience of acting to imply consciousness, so I don't uh, have to add that it's conscious. And the only reason I added is that when I was working on this, I came up with that result, 
independently of this result, and then I put them together. There was one result was simple actions consist of two components, an experience of acting and a bodily movement. And the other result was you need a distinction between the prior intention and the intention and action. And the intention and action is a component of the total action. Then the obvious conclusion is the intention and action and the experience of acting are the same. It's useful to have two notions because the intention and action needn't be conscious, whereas the experience of acting is conscious. That, so all of that's, um, all of those points are important. Well, we've already solved some of our puzzles. Um, so, for example, uh, the Davidson and Chisholm examples: how you have an intention that causes the event, but it wasn't an intentional action. In both cases, you went from the prior intention to the bodily movement without an intervening intention and action. Let's go through it. In the Chisholm case, Bill intended to kill his uncle. His intention caused a bodily movement that resulted in the death of his uncle. But there was never a moment at which he had an intention and action. If you ask him, Bill, what are you doing? He couldn't say, I am now killing my uncle. What he says is, oops, I seem to have I've lost, my gosh, my foot slipped off the brake. I've run over a pedestrian. Oh my gosh, it's my uncle. Now that's a case where he's not describing an intention and action. He's describing how the prior intention caused a bodily movement. Similarly in the Davidson, uh, similarly in the Davidson case, in that case, the guy does not say, Okay, I got a prior intention. Now what the hell am I supposed to do next? Oh yeah, I read Searle and he says the prior intention has to lead to an intention and action. Okay, here goes intention and action. I'm gonna release the rope. Go, los, he's German speaking, los, he says. Um, okay, that's not the case. The case is I got this prior intention to kill my uncle. Boy, it sure as hell makes me, uh, no, it's, uh, sorry, it's said kill the other climber on the road. Well, it's time the climber's his uncle, okay. Um, I, I, I got my intention, I got a prior intention to release my hold on the rope. Sure makes me nervous. Oh my gosh, I've dropped the rope. Uh, and that's the case where he didn't do it intentionally. In neither of those cases was there an intention, an action, because in neither case was there an answer to the question, what are you now doing? which specified the content of an intention and action. That, by the way, is how you get the content of an intention and action. What are you now doing? I, and in neither case could the guy answer by specifying an intention and action, trying to kill my uncle, trying to release my hold on the rope. In both cases, he describes something that is happening to him and is caused by the prior intention, but the prior intention caused the bodily movement without an intervening intention and action. Okay, now we have the bare bones of a theory of action. An action, an, a successfully performed intentional action consists of two components, an intention and action and the bodily movement that is caused by the intention in action. That is a successfully performed intentional action. Now immediately we have to add some qualifications. What about actions that don't involve a bodily movement? Somebody says to me, sit still, and I intentionally sit still. Well in that case, the intention in action causes the absence of a bodily movement. How about mental acts? Somebody says to me, close your eyes, and do the 12 times 12 tables in your head. I can do that, and so on. I just keep doing it in my head. No bodily movement is involved, but the bodily movement or other conditions of satisfaction. The bodily movement is just the simplest kind of uh, case, but we don't want to exclude the fact that there are mental acts that don't involve a bodily movement, and there are negative acts. A good rough and ready test for whether or not something is an action is can you order somebody to do it? Can you tell them to do it? Now it's a rough and ready test because people do say things like cheer up. I'm always mad as hell when people tell me to cheer up. What am I supposed to do? What is the intention and action I'm supposed to have? Smile like the idiot guy on the smiley uh, uh, picture. I think what they mean is, well try to look at the bright side of things. Okay, I could do that. 
uh, things are bad, but they could be worse, I guess. Um, but uh, people do say things like cheer up or be honest, I, and there isn't any answer to the question, what are you now doing, which goes, I am cheering up. Uh, there is, that's not the name of an intention in action. However, it's a good rough and ready test. Can you tell people to do it? And notice another interesting thing. The order to do something and the order to try to do it typically order the same thing. If I say to you, walk across that street, that's the same order as try to walk across that street. The only thing, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say try if it were easy. I mean, I would only say try if there's likely to be some difficulty. If somebody says to me, try at all costs to raise this piece of chalk. Well, that's a bit odd. I, I did raise the piece of chalk, and I did it intentionally, but it didn't take any special effort. However, uh, these are points about ordinary usage. The basic idea here is that every intentional action successfully performed consists in an intention in action and the rest of the conditions of satisfaction which are typically a bodily movement, but need not be. They could be just a thought or, or the absence of a bodily movement. Anything that the intention and action can cause by way of intentional causation, I haven't got to intentional causation yet, but anything that the intention and action can cause by way of intentional causation, that is an intentional action. That is the condition of satisfaction of an intention in action. Okay, well, you've now got the bare bones of a theory of action. Now we need to make it more complicated. I mean, if life was just a matter of raising your arm, scratching your head, sitting still, it'd be kind of easy. But how about complicated cases? But let's take questions for how far we got. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably phenomenologically more accurately the right way to describe it, is that the, the prior intention itself evolves into the intention and action. You wait until the moment comes, and then you haul off and do it. Now, I do say something in the course of the book that you read that's false, and it was cheerfully pointed out to me by another professional philosopher. There's nothing those best, well, that they like better than pointing out falsehoods, but it was a, a, a good correction. I say that the prior intention stops and the intention in action starts. But there are lots of cases where the prior intention keeps on going. I, I intend uh, to swim the English Channel. Now that's a prior intention. But while I'm actually swimming, while I'm actually trying, the prior intention will continue to monitor my swimming of the English Channel. So I, in the more complicated cases, the prior intention keeps right on going all the way through uh, to the end. It keeps monitoring us. Uh, and indeed, there are curious cases of intentions in action. People typically ask me, what are you working on now? And what I state is an intention in action. I'm writing a book on, and then I, well, actually, I'm writing three books on, and a guy, and I, and I feel embarrassed. The guy tells you he's writing a book, he's probably a liar. If he tells you he's writing two books, he's crazy. If he tells you he's writing three books, walk away. He doesn't know what, he, what it's like to write a book. Anyway, so I happen to be writing three books. Uh, that's three intentions in action that I have, and they spread out over a number of years. Uh, you can have an intention and action that lasts many years. And let's not us forget St. Simeon Stylites, who had an intention and action to serve God by sitting on top of a pillar for 35 years. What are you doing up there, Simeon? And his answer states an intention and action. Everybody re remembers St. Simeon's. I haven't thought about St. Simeon Stylites for a while, but uh, I, I, there he was on top of his pillar. Uh, OK, well, each to his own intentions. All right, now we have to move on to the more complicated case where you have a complex action. As I said, it's not enough that you just scratch your head. You've got to do complicated things. Uh, so I'll give you an example of a complicated action. But again, I want to make sure everybody's up with this, because Jennifer said I went too fast last time. I want everybody on board with all of this. You got the distinction between the prior intention and the intention and action. The prior intention represents the whole action. The intention and action just represents the bodily movement. Both are causal. Both have a causally self-reflexive condition of satisfaction. OK, I want you to see all of that. Yes, Jennifer, and then you. Yeah. It is, yeah. Well, give me an example. Well, 
Oh, I see. Okay. Well, there are cases where uh, you can have an, an ex a conscious, uh, let's call the experience of acting, the conscious IA, call it a CSIA. And the point about the IA is that it can uh, uh, become conscious, uh, now conscious, now unconscious. I can be thinking about it or not thinking about it. Okay, I agree with that. You had a question. And then you. Yeah. Uh, intention and action is still intention. Yeah. Yeah. Content, yeah. Action. It doesn't seem. It seems misleading to say an action has propositional content when it involves a bodily motion, which can be described by several materially equivalent but completely different descriptions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay, let me spell this out. This is the puzzle that people have, and I and it's a very it's a good philosophical puzzle. Typically, an action is a bodily movement. Now, what the hell is this stuff about a propositional content? How can a bodily movement have a propositional content? And the answer is, a bodily movement is a successfully performed intentional action only if the bodily movement itself is caused by an intention and action. Hence, the action itself consists not just of the bodily movement alone, but the combination of intention and action plus bodily movement where the relationship of one of, is one of causation. So any action, any successfully performed intentional action equals an intention and action which causes a bodily movement. And it's this whole package which is the action. Sometimes we just specify the, the a bodily movement part. His arm went up. But if we say he intentionally raised his arm, then we're specifying the whole thing. Yes? No, he had, he, now, but here's, here's the point. Now, we, we have to I get to these cases of, of uh, equivalence. He performed an intentional action of marrying Jocasta. He performed the action of marrying his mother unintentionally. Why? Because the intentional content of the intention in action referred to Jocasta and not to mom. We say to him, Oedipus, what are you trying to do? And, it's, and his answer is going to be, I'm trying to marry my girlfriend, Joe Caston. I want everybody to shut up so we can get on with the ceremony. But if we say to him, but wait a second, you're marrying your mom, he's going to say, well, that's not what I'm trying to do. And now this reaches a very, uh, this is a very deep point that I haven't got to yet, but it's a, a, another scene of great combat in analytic philosophy. It's called the problem of substitutability of identicals. Uh, Oedipus wanted to marry Jocasta. Jocasta was identical with mom. He did not want to marry mom, right? And there are z a zillion examples like this, and uh, philosophers love this, and it's got a name. It's called the problem of referential opacity. Uh, in these contexts where you specify the content of an intentional state, uh, e, that's Oedipus, call him Ed. Ed wants to marry Jay, that's Jocasta, his girlfriend, and Jay is identical with mom. It doesn't follow. Ed, Oedipus wants to marry mom. Now, that's bad news in logic and philosophy because it violates uh, the second law of identity theory. The second law says if two objects are identical, then every property of one is a property of the other. If it's a property of Jocasta that Oedipus wants to marry her, and uh, Jocasta is identical with mom, then it's a property of mom that Oedipus wants to marry her, only he doesn't want to marry her. He will insist that he doesn't want to marry her. Hold off on that. I, if you absorb the theory of action, I'll get to the referential opacity later. Remember, referential opacity is immensely useful to you as a philosopher. And here's how I found it useful. I, I find myself riding on airplanes all the time. And typically, the guy wants to know, what do you do for a living? And I say, I'm a professional philosopher. And he then spouts his philosophy, as he would tell us. 
And typically, he says things like, oh, I love philosophy. I'm a great fan of Rana, 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 Rana Kushman, the great Indian mystic. What do you think of Rama, Rama, Shmari, Kushman? And if you say, I don't, I never heard of him, you sound like you're an idiot. Uh, so what I say is, I specialize in referential opacity. And that shuts them up. After that, they never ha hassle me about Rari, Rari, Mara, Kushman, or whatever their favorite Indian mystic is. But you want to be careful on airplanes. I had a friend who was riding on an airplane. We were all meeting in, uh, in Turkey. And he sat next to a woman. Uh, and uh, she, you know, they started talking, where are you from, and so on. Uh, and uh, he is, in fact, the mayor of San Francisco. And, and um, I, I, the woman said to him, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm in the restaurant business, which is true. Uh, and, and where are you from? I'm from San Francisco. And she then said, well, I love San Francisco, but that mayor they've got in San Francisco, <laughs> he is really a kook. Now, he had a discipline that I would not have. That's why he's mayor and I'm not. He never said, I'm the mayor. He, uh, he said, uh, yeah, I guess he is kind of a strange guy, that mayor of San Francisco. He didn't let on that he was the mayor. I would not have had that kind of discipline. But Gad, the reason Gavin's mayor and I'm not is that he said, yeah, he agreed with her, that, that very strange guy, the mayor of San Francisco. Anyway, be careful of airplanes uh, conversations, but it's very important to have, hold referential opacity in reserve because it kills boring conversations. Uh, okay, we'll come back to referential opacity. Yes. I can't hear you. Yes. No, that's right. I, I wanted to, uh, that's why I said there are mental acts as well. I intend to plan the rest of my life uh, during the Labor Day weekend. It will be perfectly good. That's a prior intention. And then what you do on the Labor Day weekend is you sit down and think about what you want to do. And, and that's like, uh, I gave an example which is like that, where somebody tells you to do the 12 times table it's in your head. Or I say, close your eyes and form an image of the Eiffel Tower. Okay, and you do that, uh, and uh, that would be, you will have carried out the action. You will have intentionally formed an image. So it needn't be a bodily movement. Uh, philosophers like to talk about bodily movements because they're easier and you can see them. And it's, uh, the philosophers are always um, feel more comfortable if they can call it physical. Uh, if it's physical, they think they understand it better. But a lot, of mental, a lot of actions are perfectly mental, and that's perfectly all right that it's mental. Okay, I want to make sure everybody's on board. Vanessa at the back. Yes. Well, the intention and action can last a long time. I have an intention and action to write a book about the philosophy of language, and it'll go on for years. Uh, it, well, it need not. It can be episodic. It doesn't bother me much while I'm asleep. Uh, but you can have a standing intentional state. You see, intentional states need not be uh, conscious feelings of tickles and itches like that. Uh, you can have a long-term prior intention, and you can have a long-running intention and action. I, I am. Tr I, if somebody says to me, "Well, what are you up to these days?" I can literally say, "Well, right now I'm trying to write a book on the philosophy of language, but I have too many other distractions, and I keep getting." Some Track. That's literally the case. And it's, it's important in philosophy, Wittgenstein reminded of this, not to get fastened on to overly simple examples, to think, well, uh, it's always got to be like raising your arm. There are lots of things that involve very complex extended actions over long periods of time. It's simpler when we talk about them to take the instantaneous cases. Um, I, I, your uh, Bill is trying to kill his uncle or something like that. And those are good to start off with, but you have to remember that a typical human planning, an, another name for plan, is a prior intention. And the formation of a prior intention is called a decision. So you make up your mind that is a decision, and that will then result in a plan, and a plan is a prior intention. And then the prior intention, when you begin to act on it, will be called trying. You will then be trying to do something, and that trying can extend over a long period of time. Yes, I haven't had a question from you for half an hour, so better get on the ball here. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, no, it's not frustrated. It's just I am not now acting on it, you see. I, and it's, I'm, not, I'm not at this instant carrying out that intention and action. Does that bother you? Well, work on it, you know. What? Well, they, uh, the prior intention, well, more naturally, would say I'm not now acting on it. But wh how big is now? This is a puzzle about time and not about, uh, not about intentionality. Uh, there is a, fam there are a famous puzzle in philosophy about uh, 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 the size of now. Is it instantaneous or does it extend over? If I say, well, we're now in a serious economic crisis, well, guess what? Now can last for months, maybe even years. So I think this is a problem about now. But in any case, intentions in action are, intentions in action are a current events. It's just that the event can last a long time. And a prior intention is a state. This is why the natural English for intention and action is trying. And, and you can be trying to do something without trying a, a 24 hour, without trying to do it 24 hours a day every second of those 24 hours. Okay, yes. How big can the action be? Yeah. Example, you can be trying to solve the problem in a different language. Right. Even when you're eating or yeah. you know, just walk across the road, you can still be, that's part of the whole life cycle. Right. Okay, now this again, all these are great questions. The question is, uh, how big uh, can the uh, prior, was it the prior intention? How big can the prior intention be? Uh, and the, the point is that a lot of these cases have to do with background abilities. Uh, so I'm going to give you the example of a, another case of a guy who commits murder by p pulling the trigger and firing a gun. But I think uh, most professional gunmen don't have to think about pulling the trigger. That's just a background skill. They just think, fire the gun. Now the question is, how skillful can you get? See, when I'm speaking to you, I don't have to think, I'm about to pronounce a T, so put the damn tongue next to the damn teeth to pronounce the T. I don't have to think that, I just do it. I'm pretty good with T. You know, I have problems with, with other things, but I'm pretty good when it comes to the tongue on the tip to the, well, anyway, I can do it, I'll, I'll demonstrate it to you, okay. So I don't have to form a prior intention of that. That's part of my skill, that's a background ability. The question is, how skillful can you get? What I would li I like is would be able to think, well, my prior intention is very simple. Flourish. I'll just <laughs> flourish. And there won't be any answer to the question, well, how do you flourish? Any more than this question, how do you pronounce the T? I just do it. I just haul off every day and flourish. And it needn't be on a day-to-day -day thing. I'll flourish over the next few decades. Uh, well, I can't do that. Am I limits? my skills, and that's an interesting, an, an interesting question. You raise a very deep question, and I can't answer it yet. We'll get to the background. The general principle I want you to keep in mind is the level of intentionality rises to the level of the background skill. So when I tell you you're going to write me a paper, I don't have to say, now you've got to find the keys on the keyboard and punch each key for each letter in the word you want to type. That, I assume, is part of your background. I take that for granted as your background ability. Uh, but the question is, how skillful can you be? How, how rich a background can you have? OK, so let's go on. Now I'm going to introduce the next complexity, and that is the notion of complex actions. Uh, but even this is partly disappointing, because I'm going to take complex actions that are, so to speak, instantaneous and not spread over long periods of time. And I will, I, following this great philosophical tradition, I'll pick another murderous example. Uh, this is an a actual historical case. Uh, the First World War reputedly was started uh, because of the uh, assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in a town called Sarajevo by a radical student named Gavrilo Princip. Uh, and Gavrilo was a bunch, was a group, a member of a group of radical student nuts. 
in Sarajevo. By the way, I once gave a lecture in Chicago where I said all that, and it turns out they're uh, full of all these uh, uh, Serbians in the audience, and they had, Gavrilo was their national hero. There's a statue of him in Sarajevo, so I got in a lot of trouble. Anyway, uh, all the same, uh, there was this thinker, uh, uh, Gavrilo Princip, and he was a member of a group of radical students, and they set out to murder uh, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, only uh, they were hopeless. Uh, they went to the wrong place, and they, uh, they missed the car. On the other hand, the guys driving the Archduke were just as hopeless. They got lost in the streets of Sarajevo, and they went into this side street, and the car stopped and had to back up to turn around. And at that point, Gavrilo found himself face to face with the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his Morganatic wife. So uh, Gavrilo hauls out this huge revolver of his and starts blasting holes into uh, the Archduke and his wife. And if we ask him, Gavrilo, what on earth are you doing? He would then state the content of an intention and action, what he's trying to do. Now notice, all of this is going to be part of the content of his intention. He pulled the trigger. That's one of the things he was trying to do. He fired the gun. He shot the Archduke. He killed the Archduke. He struck a blow. He struck a blow against Austria and indeed against the Austro-Hungarian army. I'll just say against A. And he avenged Serbia not to mention Bosnia and Herzegovina. He avenged Serbia. OK, now we can say all of those are true of Gavrilo. There are a whole lot of other things that happened that are not part of the content of his intention and action. He made bullet holes in the upholstery of the car. Now, that's not what he's trying to do. If we said to Gavrilo, what are you trying to do? He said, I'm trying to make a nice pattern in the damn seats, and those people got in the way. That's a different story. We know, and by the way, if you're ever in Vienna, next time you're in Vienna, go look at the car. It's an absolute gem. It's a 1914 uh, a, a touring, I think it was made in 1911. It's one of those fantastic old Central European touring cars, and there, sure enough, are the bullet holes in the upholstery. Uh, okay, but that wasn't what he was trying to do. That, so to speak, is a side effect, an unintended consequence. Now, there are a whole lot of things that happened off to the side. Uh, we know that he made a lot of noise, raised a lot of uh, dust uh, in the uh, street. Uh, and then there are things that happened up here. Uh, we know that he secreted acetylcholine at the axon end plates of his motor neurons because uh, no a secretion of acetylcholine, uh, no pulling of the trigger. But if we asked him, Gavrilo, what are you trying to do? And he said, I'm trying to secrete acetylcholine at the axon end plates of my motor neurons. Well, he must be a medical student or something like that. Or uh, not, Nobody knew that in, in uh, 1914. But anyway, that's something that happened. OK, so this is stuff that's not part of the intention in action, though it did happen. And then down here, there are a whole lot of things that happened, I can't even write them all on the blackboard, uh, which were consequences or effects of his killing the Archduke. Uh, reputedly, he started the First World War. We know that he made, we, he made uh, Wilhelm II, the Emperor of Germany, very angry. Uh, we know that he upset his father, uh, he upset the Archduke's father, the Emperor, uh, because the Emperor was convinced that God was punishing the family because the Archduke married riffraff. He married a countess. That's why a minor aristocrat. And that's why it was only a morganatic marriage. You can look this up. It wasn't an honest to John marriage. It was a morganatic marriage. And God was surely punishing us, punishing us for messing around with countesses, for God's sake. Uh, and furthermore, if you added all the other things that happened, uh, we knew that it ruined Sir Edward Grey's summer party season in London. Uh, after that was all over for Sir Edward. 
And if we, but if we asked Gavrilo, what on earth are you doing? And he said, I'm wrecking the party season for Sir Edward Gray. No more parties for him. Uh, and a lot of people will tell you uh, that he also uh, caused uh, the Bolshevik Revolution. So he had a lot going for him. But none of that stuff is part of the intention in action. Now, this has a name. Uh, this whereby you can expand or contract the description of the action is called the accordion effect. And that term, uh, what's the name of that guy? Uh, he used to be in Arizona. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. I can't remember names anymore. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the top, uh, the accordion effect is the effect whereby you can expand or contract the description of the action as you can expand or contract an accordion. Now, a lot of people who write about these things say, well, you can keep going with the expansion of the accordion. That's not true. If it's the accordion of the intention in action, the boundaries of the accordion are set by the boundaries of the complex intention and action. What is it that you're trying to do? That's the boundaries of the accordion. Okay, so that's one thing I wanted to tell you. There's an accordion effect. Now, the second thing about this is there's a break here between these steps and these steps. In the case of the first four step, the event described in the first level caused the event described in the second level. That is, pulling the trigger caused the gun to fire. Firing the gun caused the archduke to be shot. Shooting the archduke caused the death of the archduke. It caused the, uh, the, uh, the archduke to be killed. Notice that it didn't cause a different action. This is one action that has these different levels of description. He, he fired the gun by means of pulling the trigger. He shot the Archduke by means of firing the gun. He killed the Archduke by means of shooting him. Each of these is a causal by means of relation. But the last two are not causal by means of relations, but they are constitutive by way of relations because killing the Archduke didn't cause a, a blow to be struck against Austria. It just was. It constituted striking a blow. Striking a blow didn't cause Serbia to be avenged. It just was the avenging of Serbia. So these are what I call constitutive by way of relations. And this is causal by means of relations. Now, typically, complex actions have those two elements in the structure. And it's very important to understand both of those when we get to the structure of social behavior. Making the ma a mark on the ballot paper didn't cause me to vote. It just constituted voting. I made the mark in order uh, to vote. By w I did it by way of voting. But there weren't two events my making the mark and my voting, because in that context, making the mark just was voting. That was a constitutive by way of relation. And we're going to have to see how this functions in society. Because in complex social behavior, you get a distinction between the causal, between what causes what and what constitutes what. Uh, they, uh, they're getting the majority of votes I, in Congress, and getting the bill signed by the president didn't cause the passage of the health care reform. It just constituted it. That was it. Once you've done that, it's been done. So you have these two sets of relations in the structure of complex actions. And that's the by, causal by means of relation of the various components of the action, as well as the uh, constitutive by way of relations, whereby at one level of description constitutes the next level of description. Now, that I want that to sound innocent, but human civilization is built on that. The pieces of paper are constitutive of money. Uh, the noises I'm making now are constitutive of giving a lecture. And how is that possible? How is it possible that we get these different levels? People have that restive look. Have I run out of time? Am I, how much time have I got? OK, I got a, little, a few more minutes. OK, well, let's keep going with this. So there's another notion that I want you to have, and that is the top level here. Uh, there are some things in your life that you can do 
without intending to do anything else by way of which or by means of which you do them. And they're called basic actions. And this is an answer to a question that, that uh, uh, this uh, person asked me. Uh, the basic action is one where there isn't any answer to the question, well, how did you do it? Or uh, what did you do in order to do it? You just hauled off and did it. If somebody says to me, raise your arm, I just raise it. And if they, well, they say, well, how did you do it? Just like that, I just did it. Now, there are war wounded people with brain damage and they have to be taught to raise their arm. You plant the right foot and then you go through the steps. For them, it's not a basic action. For most of us, it's a basic action. And when I, I, I talk, my pronunciation of the words and the sentences for me is a basic action. I've been doing this for some years and I'm fairly good at English so I can do it without having to intend to do something else by way of which or by means of which I do it. And the question then, so what is basic will be relative to your background abilities. A really good pianist might just haul off and play an arpeggio and we say, well, you know, how did you do it? She just does it. In my case, I have a hell of a time finding middle C, right? It's that white job next to the three black jobs in the middle, or maybe there are only two. I could find it if the gun was at my head. Okay, so for me, playing a musical piece, playing an arpeggio, that's not a basic action. What is basic for one person will not be basic for another person because basicness is relative to the background. It's relative to your background skills, and that raises the question I asked earlier, how skillful could you get? Uh, I'm pretty good at walking across the room and driving my car and uh, eating my lunch, but I'd like to get more skillful so I could just haul off and flourish and not have to worry about all that other crap that gets in the way in between. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Uh, okay, so you've got the notion of the basic action, the notion of the accordion effect, uh, the distinction between the causal by means of relation and the constitutive by way of relation. And now we've got a theory of human action that accom accommodates both simple actions like raising your arm and complex actions like starting the revolution where you do one thing by means of something else or do one thing by way of something else. Now we have to answer some of those puzzle cases. If this is the structure of the intentional action, then what's an unintentional action? And it, implicit in what I've said is this. For any successfully performed action, there'll be lots of side effects, which were not part of the complex intention in action. And there'll be lots of subsequent effects, which are not part of the complex intention in action. But all of those were unintended consequences or unintended side effects. And this, by the way, is going to be immensely important when we talk about social reality uh, because uh, uh, most of the interesting uh, uh, public policies have all sorts of side effects which are not intended uh, but which can be quite catastrophic. Sometimes they're beneficial, but they can also be very bad. Um, all right, so we have a notion of an intentional action, and we define that in terms of a satisfied intention and action, but we also have the notion of an unintentional action, and an unintentional action is just an intentional action which has consequences, uh, which uh, has effects or consequences which were not a part of the condition of satisfaction of the intention. Uh, so that gives us a, a, a simple kind of theory, uh, at least uh, for a very large number of cases. But now we have an interesting question. What about collective actions? When we all haul off and do something together, how do we get collective intentionality? Let me stop for questions, because if you understand everything in this, like, oh yeah, I, I, I have this lovely chart. Uh, look at the chart, because most of this stuff is on the chart. Um, I, we, we talked about prior intentions and intentions in action, but you notice you get a mirror image between that and cognition. Perception has uh, the downhill direction of fit, but the condition of satisfaction, if you actually see your hand in front of your face, then the presence and features of your hand have to cause the seeing of it, they have to cause the visual experience. 
So you get the mind to world direction of fit because of the world to mind direction of causation. And that's true with memory as well. If you really remember the picnic that you went on last week, then it must be that the fact that you're going on that picnic caused your memory of it. So you have the mind to world direction of fit in virtue of the world to mind direction of causation. In the case of intention and intentional action, the arrows run the opposite way. That is, if you intend to do something and you succeed in doing it, then you achieve the world to mind direction of fit. That is, the world in the form of your behavior matches your intention in your mind only in virtue of the mind to world direction of causation, only because your intention brought that about. Now, there's one thing that I didn't know how to fit on this chart, and that is, in the case of intentions and actions and prior intentions, there's a causal gap between the preceding state and the actual trying or uh, the actual formation of the prior intention. You're thinking about who to vote for, and you make up your mind. That's a formation of a prior intention. You get in the ballot booth, and you vote for the guy you decided to vote for. But in neither case do you have causally sufficient conditions, unless it's a pathological case. In a normal case, you made up your mind, but you still don't have to do it. You could always change your mind. And given your reasons, you didn't have to make up your mind that, that way. There's a causal gap. And that gap has a name. It's called the freedom of the will. And that is a hell of a mess, but we got it. I don't know how to put it. I, I, I didn't have enough freedom of will to figure out how to put it uh, on the chart. But there, there is a causal gap in, on, the in, uh, on the action side, excuse me which you don't get on the cognition side. You see, notice an important point. In philosophy, we have a problem of the freedom of the will, but there's no problem of the freedom of perception. Nobody says, well, it's true my hand in front of my, is in front of my face, but I have freedom of perception. I can see any damn thing I want to see. No, you don't. Whereas when it comes to raising my arm, I'm pretty good at exercising free will. I can rec any, any damn thing I want, I can do uh, where they are in the arm raising line of business. Okay, so we've got an asymmetry that's not on the chart, and that asymmetry has a name. It's the freedom of the will. All right, next Tuesday, we're going to go on about collective intentionality and the structure of collective intentions.